Book Two, Chapters Eight and Nine of the Wars of the Jews. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter Eight. The Three Sects. For there are three philosophical sects among the Jews. The followers of the first, of which are the Pharisees, of the second, the Sadducees, and the third sect. Which pretends to a severer discipline, are called ascents. These last are Jews by birth, and seem to have a greater affection for one another than the other sects have. These ascents reject pleasures as an evil, but esteem continence and the conquest over our passions to be virtue. They neglect wedlock, but choose out other persons' children while they are pliable and fit for learning. And esteem them to be of their kindred, and form them according to their own manners. They do not absolutely deny the fitness of marriage, and the succession of mankind thereby continued, but they guard against the lascivious behaviour of women, and are persuaded that none of them preserve their fidelity to one man. These men are despisers of riches, and so very communicative as raises our admiration. Nor is there any one to be found among them who hath more than another, for it is a law among them that those who come to them must let what they have to be common to the whole order, insomuch that among them all there is no appearance of poverty or excess of riches, but every one's possessions are intermingled with every other's possessions, and so there is, as it were, one patrimony among all the brethren. They think that oil is a defilement, and if any one of them be anointed without his own approbation, it is wiped off his body, for they think to be sweaty is a good thing, as they do also to be clothed in white garments. They also have stewards appointed to take care of their common affairs, who every one of them have no separate business for any, but what is for the uses of them all. They have no one certain city, but many of them dwell in every city, and if any of their sect come from other places, what they have lies open for them, just as if it were their own, and they go into such as they never knew before, as if they had been ever so long acquainted with them. For which reason they carry nothing at all with them when they travel into remote parts, though still they take their weapons with them, for fear of thieves. Accordingly, there is, in every city where they live, one appointed particularly to take care of strangers, and to provide garments and other necessaries for them. But the habit and management of their bodies is such as children use, or in fear of their masters. Nor do they allow of the change of garments or of shoes, till they be first torn to pieces, or worn out by time. Nor do they either buy or sell anything to one another, but every one of them gives what he hath to him that wanteth it, and receives from him again in lieu of it what may be convenient for himself. And although there be no requital made, they are fully allowed to take what they want of whomsoever they please. And as for their piety towards God, it is very extraordinary. For before sun rising they speak not a word about profane matters, but put up certain prayers which they have received from their forefathers, as if they made a supplication for its rising. After this, every one of them are sent away by their curators to exercise some of those arts wherein they are skilled, in which they labour with great diligence till the fifth hour. After which they assemble themselves together again into one place. And when they have clothed themselves in white veils, they then bathe their bodies in cold water. And after this purification is over, they every one meet together in an apartment of their own, into which it is not permitted to any of another sect to enter, while they go, after a pure manner, into the dining room, as into a certain holy temple, and quietly set themselves down. Upon which the baker lays them loaves in order. The cook also brings a single plate of one sort of food, 
and sets it before every one of them. But a priest says grace before meat, and it is unlawful for any one to taste of the food before grace be said. The same priest, when he hath dined, says grace again after meat, and when they begin and when they end, they praise God as he that bestows their food upon them, after which they lay aside their white garments, and betake themselves to their labours again till the evening. Then they return home to supper, after the same manner. And if there be any strangers there, they sit down with them. Nor is there ever any clamour or disturbance to pollute their house, but they give every one leave to speak in their turn which silence thus kept in their house appears to foreigners like some tremendous mystery, the cause of which is that perpetual sobriety they exercise, and the same settled measure of meat and drink that is allotted them, and that, such as is abundantly sufficient for them. And truly, as for other things, they do nothing but according to the injunctions of their curators, only these two things are done among them at every one's own free will, which are to assist those that want it, and to show mercy. For they are permitted of their own accord to afford succour to such as deserve it when they stand in need of it, and to bestow food on those that are in distress, but they cannot give anything to their kindred without the curators. They dispense their anger after a just manner, and restrain their passion. They are eminent for fidelity, and are the ministers of peace. Whatsoever they say also is firmer than an oath, but swearing is avoided by them, and they esteem it worse than perjury, or they say that he who cannot be believed without swearing by God is already condemned. Footnote. This practice of the ascends in refusing to swear, and esteeming swearing in ordinary occasions worse than perjury, is delivered here in general words, as are the parallel injunctions of our Saviour, Matthew 6, verse 34, 23, verse 16, and of St. James, 5, verse 12. But all admit of particular exceptions for solemn causes, and on great and necessary occasions. Thus these very ascends, who here do so zealously avoid swearing, are related, in the very next section, to admit none, till they take tremendous oaths to perform their several duties to God, and to their neighbour, without supposing they thereby break this rule, not to swear at all. The case is the same in Christianity, as we learn from the apostolical constitutions, which although they agree with Christ and St. James, in forbidding to swear in general, Yet do they explain it elsewhere by avoiding to swear falsely, and to swear often and in vain, and again by not swearing at all, but withal adding that, if that cannot be avoided, to swear truly, which abundantly explain to us the nature of the measures of this general injunction. End footnote. They also take great pains in studying the writings of the ancients, and choose out of them what is most for the advantage of their soul and body. And they inquire after such roots and medicinal stones as may cure their distempers. But now, if any one hath a mind to come over to their sect, he is not immediately admitted, but he is prescribed the same method of living which they use for a year, while he continues excluded. And they give him also a small hatchet and the forementioned girdle, and the white garment. And when he hath given evidence during that time that he can observe their continence, he approaches nearer to their way of living, and is made a partaker of the waters of purification. Yet is he not even now admitted to live with them, for after this demonstration of his fortitude, his temper is tried two more years. And if he appear to be worthy, they then admit him into their society. And before he is allowed to touch their common food, he is obliged to take tremendous oaths that, in the first place, he will exercise piety towards God, and then that he will observe justice towards men, and that he will do no harm to anyone, either of his own accord or by the command of others, that he will always hate the wicked and be assistant to the righteous, 
that he will ever show fidelity to all men, and especially to those in authority, because no one obtains the government without God's assistance, and that if he be in authority, he will at no time whatever abuse his authority, nor endeavour to outshine his subjects either in his garments or any other finery, that he will be perpetually a lover of truth, and propose to himself to reprove those that tell lies, that he will keep his hands clear from theft, and his soul from unlawful gains, and that he will neither conceal anything from those of his own sect, nor discover any of their doctrines to others, no, not though any one should compel him so to do at the hazard of his life. Moreover, he swears to communicate their doctrines to no one any otherwise than as he received them himself, that he will abstain from robbery, and will equally preserve the books belonging to their sect, and the names of the angels, or messengers. Footnote. This mention of the names of angels, so particularly preserved by the SNs, if it means more than those messengers which were employed to bring them the peculiar books of their sect, looks like a prelude to that worshipping of angels blamed by St. Paul as superstitious and unlawful in some such sort of people as these SNs were, Colossians 2 verse 8, as is the prayer to or towards the sun for his rising every morning, mentioned before, section 5, very like those not much later observances, made mention of in the preaching of Peter, and regarding a kind of worship of angels, of the month, and of the moon, and not celebrating the new moons, or other festivals, unless the moon appeared. Which, indeed, seems to me the earliest mention of any regard to the phases in fixing the Jewish calendar of which the Talmud and later rabbis talk so much, and upon so very little ancient foundation. End footnote. These are the oaths by which they secure their proselytes to themselves. But for those that are caught in any heinous sins, they cast them out of their society, and he who is thus separated from them does often die after a miserable manner, for as he is bound by the oath he hath taken, and by the customs he hath been engaged in, he is not at liberty to partake of that food that he meets with elsewhere, but is forced to eat grass, and to famish his body with hunger, till he perish. For which reason they receive many of them again when they are at their last gasp, out of compassion to them as thinking the miseries they have endured, till they came to the very brink of death, to be a sufficient punishment for the sins they had been guilty of. But in the judgments they exercise, they are most accurate and just, nor do they pass sentence by the votes of a court that is fewer than a hundred. And as to what is once determined by that number, it is unalterable. What they most of all honour, after God himself, is the name of their legislator, Moses, whom, if any one blaspheme, he is punished capitally. They also think it a good thing to obey their elders, and the major part. Accordingly, if ten of them be sitting together, no one of them will speak, while the other nine are against it. They also avoid spitting in the midst of them, or on the right side. Moreover, they are stricter than any other of the Jews in resting from their labours on the seventh day. For they not only get their food ready the day before, that they may not be obliged to kindle a fire on that day, but they will not remove any vessel out of its place, nor go to stool thereon. Nay, on other days they dig a small pit, a foot deep, with a paddle, which kind of hatchet is given them when they are first admitted among them and covering themselves round with their garment, that they may not affront the divine rays of light, they ease themselves into that pit, after which they put the earth that was dug out again into the pit. And even this they do only in the more lonely places, which they choose out for this purpose. And although this easement of the body be natural, yet it is a rule with them to wash themselves after it, 
as if it were a defilement to them. Now, after the time of their preparatory trial is over, they are parted into four classes, and so far are the juniors inferior to the seniors, that if the seniors should be touched by the juniors, they must wash themselves, as if they had intermixed themselves with the company of a foreigner. They are long-lived also, insomuch that many of them live above a hundred years, by means of the simplicity of their diet. Nay, as I think, by means of the regular course of life they observe also. They contemn the miseries of life, and are above pain, by the generosity of their mind. And as for death, if it will be for their glory, they esteem it better than living always. And indeed, our war with the Romans gave abundant evidence what great souls they had in their trials, wherein, although they were tortured and distorted, burnt and torn to pieces, and went through all kinds of instruments of torment, that they might be forced either to blaspheme their legislator, or to eat what was forbidden them, yet could they not be made to do either of them. No, nor once to flatter their tormentors, or to shed a tear. But they smiled in their very pains, and laughed those to scorn who inflicted the torments upon them, and resigned up their souls with great alacrity, as expecting to receive them again. For their doctrine is this, that bodies are corruptible, and that the matter they are made of is not permanent, but that the souls are immortal and continue for ever, and that they come out of the most subtle air, and are united to their bodies as to prisons, into which they are drawn by a certain natural enticement, but that when they are set free from the bonds of the flesh, they then, as released from a long bondage, rejoice and mount upward. And this is like the opinions of the Greeks, that good souls have their habitations beyond the ocean, in a region that is neither oppressed with storms of rain or snow, or with intense heat, but that this place is such as is refreshed by the gentle breathing of a west wind that is perpetually blowing from the ocean, while they allot to bad souls a dark and tempestuous den, full of never-ceasing punishments. And indeed, the Greeks seem to me to have followed the same notion, when they allot the islands of the blessed to their brave men, whom they call heroes and demigods, and to the souls of the wicked, the region of the ungodly, in Hades, where their fables relate that certain persons, such as Sisyphus, and Tantalus, and Ixion, and Titius, are punished, which is built on this first supposition, that souls are immortal, and thence are those exhortations to virtue, and dehortations from wickedness collected, whereby good men are bettered in the conduct of their life by the hope they have of reward after their death, and whereby the vehement inclinations of bad men to vice are restrained by the fear and expectation they are in, that although they should lie concealed in this life, they should suffer immortal punishment after their death. These are the divine doctrines of the ascends about the soul, which lay an unavoidable bait for such as have once had a taste of their philosophy. Footnote. Of these Jewish or Essen, and indeed Christian, doctrines concerning souls, both good and bad, in Hades, see that excellent discourse or homily of our Josephus concerning Hades at the end of the volume. End footnote. There are also those among them who undertake to foretell things to come, by reading the holy books, and using several sorts of purifications, and being perpetually conversant in the discourses of the prophets, and it is but seldom that they miss in their predictions. Footnote. Dean Aldrich reckons up three examples of this gift of prophecy in several of these ascents out of Josephus himself, viz. in the history of the war, Judas foretold the death of Antigonus at Strato's tower, Simon foretold that Archelaus should reign but nine or ten years, and in the Antiquities, Menhuam foretold that Herod should be king, and should reign tyrannically, 
and that for more than twenty or even thirty years, all which came to pass accordingly. End footnote. Moreover, there is another order of ascents, who agree with the rest as to their way of living and customs and laws, but differ from them in the point of marriage, as thinking that by not marrying they cut off the principal part of human life, which is the prospect of succession. Nay, rather, that if all men should be of the same opinion, the whole race of mankind would fail. However, they try their spouses for three years, and if they find that they have their natural purgations thrice, as trials that they are likely to be fruitful, they then actually marry them. But they do not use to accompany with their wives when they are with child, as a demonstration that they do not marry out of regard to pleasure, but for the sake of posterity. Now the women go into the baths with some of their garments on, as the men do with somewhat girded about them. And these are the customs of this order of ascents. Footnote. There is so much more here about the ascents than is cited from Josephus in Porphyry and Eusebius, and yet so much less about the Pharisees and Sadducees, the two other Jewish sects, that would naturally be expected in proportion to the ascents or third sect. Nay, that seems to be referred to by himself elsewhere, that one is tempted to suppose Josephus had at first written less of the one, and more of the two others, than his present copies afford us, as also that, by some unknown accident, our present copies are here made up of the larger edition in the first case, and of the smaller in the second. See the note in Havercamp's edition. However, what Josephus says in the name of the Pharisees, that only the souls of good men go out of one body into another, although all souls be immortal, and still the souls of the bad are liable to eternal punishment, as also what he says afterwards, that the soul's figure is immortal, and that under the earth they receive rewards or punishments according as their lives have been virtuous or vicious in the present world, that to the bad is allotted an eternal prison, but that the good are permitted to live again in this world, are nearly agreeable to the doctrines of Christianity. Only Josephus's rejection of the return of the wicked into other bodies, or into this world, which he grants to the good, looks somewhat like a contradiction to St. Paul's account of the doctrine of the Jews, that they themselves allowed that there should be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. Acts 24, verse 15. Yet because Josephus's account is that of the Pharisees, and St. Paul's that of the Jews in general, and of himself, the contradiction is not very certain. End footnote. But then, as to the two other orders at first mentioned, the Pharisees are those who are esteemed most skilful in the exact explication of their laws, and introduce the first sect. These ascribe all to fate, or providence, and to God, and yet allow that to act what is right, or the contrary, is principally in the power of men, although fate does cooperate in every action. They say that all souls are incorruptible, but that the souls of good men only are removed into other bodies, but that the souls of bad men are subject to eternal punishment. But the Sadducees are those that compose the second order, and take away fate entirely, and suppose that God is not concerned in our doing or not doing what is evil. And they say that to act what is good or what is evil, is at men's own choice, and that the one or the other belongs so to every one that they may act as they please. They also take away the belief of the immortal duration of the soul, and the punishments and rewards in Hades. Moreover, the Pharisees are friendly to one another, and are for the exercise of concord, and regard for the public but the behaviour of the Sadducees one towards another is in some degree wild, and their conversation with those that are of their own party is as barbarous as if they were strangers to them. And this is what I had to say concerning the philosophic sects among the Jews. <laughs>